Howard Priestley Jr. is someone that I've known for a long time because when I was traveling with my leader, Reverend Dr. Rap Abernathy, oftentimes Reverend Abernathy, Dr. Abernathy would take me to Mount Moriah Baptist Church. And I would sit in the back, Ava Mabel, and I would see Dr. Abernathy and Reverend Priestley Sr. strategizing and plotting movements. Reverend Creasy Sr. was on the board of SCOs. He was very close to Dr. Abernathy. And I would drive Dr. Abernathy places, you know, and I would travel with him wherever he went. I was carrying the bag. I was getting the plane tickets. I was getting the hotel. I was filling in for him, you know. And as a result, my name started drifting out there. That's how people began to know me. Because I was with Dr. Abernathy virtually everywhere he went when he became president of SCOC following the assassination of Dr. King. This morning, Reverend Creasy pulled up early in the parking lot. He was here around 11. We stood out there, Reverend Love, under the shade trees talking. And I told him that Robert Howard, who's here representing the movement of Walton County, how Robert Howard had led a car caravan from Monroe to Macon, Georgia, to New Zion Baptist Church on March 21st, 1968 at the request of Jose Williams. I told Reverend Creasy how Jose had assigned me to Walton County. I was just a kid, rookie, big afro. I weighed about 90 pounds. I thought I was somebody because I just bought my first little car. I was shiny, you know. And I came over here, even maybe I thought I was something. <laughs> Mr. Dan Young got me straight real quick would well, introduce me to the Moore's Ford Bridge lynching case by way of the photographs and the evidence. I told Reverend Creasy this because I wanted Reverend Creasy to know this before he spoke today. And I told Reverend Creasy that Dr. King was 17 years old when the lynchings occurred. And Dr. King wrote letters to everybody he could think of. The President, President Truman, he wrote letters to the U.S. Department of Justice, the Attorney General, the FBI Director, members of Congress, he wrote letters to the Atlanta Journal Constitution, and the Atlanta Constitution ran his letter on the op-ed page. He wrote letters to all the right press, the Daily World, the Pittsburgh Curial, Chicago Defender, all those papers that, you know, throughout our history we've read. Many of you won't subscribe to them. That's why they have a, such a hard time surviving. That's right. We don't advertise it, but that's why they have a hard time surviving. But I want to Reverend Creasy to know the backdrop. I want to give him a briefing on how this happened. How SCLC got involved in this movement. It was because of Dr. King. And on March 21st, 1968, in Macon at New Zion Baptist Church, when Jose called all of us little young rookies over to Macon, we saw Dr. King and Abernathy sitting at New Zion. They were promoting the Poor People's Campaign March on Washington. That's what they were doing. But Jose called us over, and I went over with Willie Bolden, Robert Howard, and many others. Robert led a caravan, about 100 cars out of here, all the way to Macon. And I saw Mr. Dan Young walk into the church, and immediately Dr. King called him down front and put him between him and Dr. Abernathy. Us rookies, you know, we were sitting in the back. We saw Mr. Young say to Dr. King, Martin, you and Ralph must come to Monroe to deal with this lynching case. And Dr. King was eating some fried chicken and some collard greens and cornbread and drinking iced tea and all of a sudden he just stopped. He stood up and he said, Dan, when Ralph and I finish with the sanitation worker strike at Memphis, we are coming to Monroe to deal with that Moore's Ford Bridge legends. And he said, you know, I was 17 when it happened and it's been on my mind ever since. He said, but Ralph and I are coming. The night that Dr. King was assassinated in Memphis, April 4th, 1968, he was scheduled to fly from Memphis to Monroe on the plane owned by the United Automobile Workers Union. Walter Ruther was president. Some of you UAW members in the room, union members in the room, you know the history of how the labor movement was entwined with the civil rights movement. But Dr. King was taken away from us on April 4th, 1968. Robert Howard was working with the Walton County Aviation Team, and they had cleaned off the airstrip out here. Not far from, you'll see it today as we travel around the county on the reenactment. 
They cleaned it off. They had the lights up. They had the flags up. And I was down the road in Social Circle in the home of Rathamur Lively, and I was watching NBC News, and Chet Hunter brought the story out, and he said, anchoring from New York, he said, Dr. King has been shot in Memphis. We have a correspondent in Memphis. We will go there in a few minutes to get a live report. And when they switched to Memphis, the correspondent was standing in front of the hospital crying. He was crying. You could see the tears streaming down his face. He had his coat off and his tie was loose and the wind was blowing his hair. He could barely say the words. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is dead. I was in the home of Rathamur Live down the road and I was stunned. I couldn't believe it. I thought it was a hoax. And the phone rang. It was Claudette Matthews calling from SCOC. Then Terry Randolph, Jose Secretary, called. You must return to Atlanta. We're going to Memphis tonight. And I remember getting in the car and driving out of Merlin Raft Yard in Social Circle. I remember parking that car at 334 Auburn Avenue, but I don't remember anything in between. There's a blank. I just can't remember anything in between. I was so upset. I was devastated. And when I walked into the headquarters on Auburn Claudette, I said, how did you get here so quick? I just spoke to you a few minutes ago. She said, you must have been running over 100 miles an hour. I said, I'm ready to go to Memphis. He said, you're in no shape. Sit down. Wait on Willie Bowler. He's coming from Macon. He and Gwen, Gwen Randall, his first wife, they were driving from Macon on a brand new white Thunderbird. And I told Reverend Creasy, we got in that car. And Willie Bowler wasn't driving fast enough to Memphis. Gwen was on the right passenger side reading a book. Bowler got on the back seat at my request and let me drive the car. That was a mistake. Because I started driving that car, 100, 120, whatever it would do. Brand new car, heavy car. I drove that car all the way to Memphis. Along the way, we didn't know it, but we met James R. Ray, who had left Memphis, headed to Atlanta in his white Mustang. He parked that car over at Capitol Homes Housing Project, which has been torn down now, right down the street from the state capitol. I wonder if Creasy to know this. And I said, when we arrived in Memphis, Memphis was burning National Guard troops on every corner, rifle bayonet. I couldn't sleep. I stayed up all night. The next morning, Dr. Abbott and I had to call us together to Reverend Billy Kyle's church. Rita Franklin was singing her song. She was vintage Rita. Y'all know how Rita used to do it. She was doing it. She was just singing and singing. Then her father, Reverend C.L. Franklin, flew in. He started preaching. But he turned it out. He wrecked the place. He wrecked the place. I mean, he wrecked it. And uh, finally, Dr. Abernathy called us together, and he said, I'll tell you what Dr. Abernathy said. I put some of these out from the back. I gave her a priest one. But any of you who would linger in the cemetery and tarry around the grave, I have news for you, said Dr. Ralph David Abernathy, just days after the murder of his father, Lee best friend, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We have business on the road to freedom. We must prove to white America that you can kill the leader, but you cannot kill the dream. That's right. That's right. That's what Dr. Abinette told us that And so I want to have a piece to understand that as the new national president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, he has inherited Reverend Love, this movement that Dr. King and Dr. Abernathy initiated. Dr. King could come, he was dead. Dr. Ralph David Abernathy came and led us from Social Circle to Monroe, 11 miles. Ava Mabel was a college student. She walked all the way. I had Willie Bowler's little baby daughter on my shoulders basically all the way. We got to Monroe. Well, the Klan was waiting on us in Social Circle. Thank God we had FBI and GBI and local police because if they hadn't been there, there would have been a riot. There would have been a massacre in Social Circle. We walked all the way. We came into Monroe. They were on the sidewalks. These state troopers were walking with their rifles and pistols out. And they told the Klan, if you come off the sidewalks, we're going to drop you. Don't, do, don't leave the sidewalk. And I remember this young white student from UGA running off the sidewalk toward me and Dr. Abinette. And all of the troopers doing were pointed at her. They told her to stop. She couldn't hear it because of the noise. And Dr. Abinette put it in front of me and, and Willie Bolden. And we marched on up to the courthouse. And Dr. Abinette spoke. Where we were two weeks ago. 
Abernathy couldn't come every time, but he came that day. Jose Williams came in and spoke right here. First AB. Right here in this pulpit. Turned it out. The Klan threatened to burn me. They, they wanted to burn me, but they couldn't find me, so they burned a little black dog with an afro with my name on it in effigy. And they told Channel 2 Action News, if we find him, we're going to burn him up. <laughs> Jose was here. But Dr. Abernathy left. And we brought Jose in, and we brought in Dr. Joseph Lyre, and he became president. He's been here three or four times. You all heard him right here. Then we brought in Jesse Jackson. Then we brought in Councilman John Lewis. Then we brought in Ambassador Andrew Young last year. Senator Charles Steele has been with us every single year since we started this movement. He'll be here later on today. He's going to speak at the bridge later today. Reverend James Orange, Teller Butler, Walter Butler, Laura Butler, Ed DeBose, Reverend Holly, Holly, John Evans, you come every year. Reverend Creasy is now a new leader at SCLC. And he has to take this, Reverend Love, to the national level. And he has to say to President Obama, along with Congressman John Lewis and the Congressional Black Caucus, President Obama, you must ask Congress to fund the Emmett Till bill. Yeah. So that we can Amen. close out the Moore's Ford Bridge Lynching, yeah. Emmett Till, Garmin Bamer, yeah. the Moore family in Florida, Harry and Harry Moore in Florida, all of these outstanding unsolved massacres. Well. That's what Reverend Creasy has been charged to by the fact that he's our new national leader. I'm proud that he's our new president. I've known him a long time. He's a preacher, he's a leader. He is a dynamic young man who is humble. Drove over here by himself this morning. Then I get by the break and he's got in his car and just drove on over here to see early. That demonstrates his level of commitment to the school. So at this time, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our new national president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, founded by Ralph David Abernathy, Martin Luther King Jr., Joseph Lock, C.K. Speaker, Fred Shuttleworth, Reverend Dr. Howard Priestley Jr., our president, Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Give him your attention. Thank you, my brother. To all of my friends who are present today, Representative Tyrone Brooks, and Reverend Albert Love, and Sister Abel Mabel, and John Patton, Brother John Evans, and Preston Torrance, and Dr. Coble, and all of the clergy and the leadership, and Mr. Helen Butler. We are so delighted for the opportunity to share this most important moment with you today here in Walton County, Monroe, Georgia. I received a phone call yesterday from President Charles Steele, former president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, wanting to ensure that I had not counseled but written in ink my commitment to be here in Walton County today. Incidentally, President Steele will uh, be honored by resolution at our national convention as President Emeritus. Under his leadership, he constructed for us the first national headquarters built from the ground up of any of the social justice movements and paid for it cash. Yes. Now in these hard recessionary times, that, that is a Herculean job. And if I could use big words to describe what Dr. Steele done for SCLC, I would tell you he had done hippopotamus well yes. and elephant large. Yes. It might be a recession on in some parts of the country, but the demographics and the statistics suggest that in the community that I live in, 
it is a depression. And we're grateful for his leadership. But he wanted to insist that that I took serious the pledge that Dr. King and Dr. Abinette made March 21st, 1968 to come here to Walton County to address the Moore Ford Bridge Massacre. Yes, it is now another century. Yes, sir. And still the people who are in power in this great country in which we live have not put in place what is necessary that justice may be realized. Yes. Yes. The laws have been put on the books, but there's no funding for the law. It is as if there are forces in this country that wish we would just go back into the corner into the darkness of the past and yeah. forget the pain and the burden that our people have experienced. But the truth of the matter is we've been beaten too profusely. And we've bled, we've bled too long. And we have suffered in the heat of the day. And we don't believe that God has brought us this far right. to leave us now. Just the other day I was in the Delta region of Mississippi where a young African American male was found swinging from a tree in early December. 2010. The sheriff took us to the crime scene. The limb that this five foot six, less than a hundred and forty pound African American man was hanging from was over seven foot tall. Don't add up. That was not a ladder, that was not an apparatus, that was no way that he could have found himself hanging from a seven foot limb. If a five foot six brother could jump that high, the NBA would have assigned him contracts. The chef did not cordon off the scene, Tyrone. He did not tape off the scene. He did not do any analytic uh, kind of forensic analysis of the crime scene. He just be glad another Negro is dead. Okay. And I stood on the court steps there in Lawrence County, the same courthouse where the Emmett Till trial was held. That has a legacy of injustice to our people. Our people were not just lynched in 1946 in Walton County, Georgia. Our people are still being lynched all across the South. Not only are there records of lynching in the Delta of Mississippi, there are records of lynching in the state of South Carolina where if the truth were told and the census takers could count we would be the majority of the population yet we're still treated as a minority and so today I, I'm glad to be here at the First African Baptist Church because that is a significant uh, milestone for me I, I, I'm delighted I'm not at the First Baptist Church in Monroe, Georgia, but the First African American Baptist Church. Yeah. 
For now, it has always been the church. It has always been the people of faith who believe that we serve a God who will liberate us from where we were to where we ought to be. So I'm glad to be back in my roots. Because here in this place, I can declare to whoever is listening, I've come this far by faith. Leaning and depending on God. Here today with our friends from Gather Yours, the NAACP, the People's Agenda. And I want to I want to share with you, my brothers and sisters, that uh, many of us are sleeping in a dangerous time. Some believe that we are already free. But while we were asleep, the enemy has sown seeds into the field. Just the other day, I remember hearing on urban radio an advertisement for the United Negro College Fund. And the narrator would say, a mine is a terrible thing to waste. That echoed and reverberated in my spirit. And many from my generation, particularly the historical black colleges and universities where we were nurtured at the feet of men and women who were pioneers in the struggle for social justice. Yes. People who had the courage to speak truth to power, and to stand in uncomfortable places and declare an uncompromising word of God. Yes. We were nurtured there. Yes. But I am afraid today that we are as a people being betrayed by our very best mind. Recently, I was interviewed by a national journalist, a Pulitzer Prize winning college professor journalist who happened to be of the African American persuasion. The journalist asked me, sir, don't you believe that SCLC and the NAACP have really served their usefulness. Should we not just have a banquet issue, a plaque give some kind of awards and close the doors? After all, some of your own leaders have declared that the struggle is over. The victory has been won. And now is the time to memorialize the movement. I said, well, it does interest me that you advocate only organizations that fight for the liberation of African American people have finished their course. I don't remember any leader from the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, or the JDL, the Jewish Defense Fund, or the Irish Catholic Society, or the Italian American Society. I, I've never heard any of their leaders when they finished their tenure in office suggesting that the work was done, they simply passed the baton to a new generation. There you go. There you go. She said, well, sir, it is possible that the work of the ADL and the work of the JDL and the work of the Irish Catholic Society and the Italian American Society is ongoing, but 
The work of the NWACP and SCLC has completed its course. Or at least many believe that it has. I said, young is that your opinion? I think so. I said, yes, sir. That, that's my opinion. I said, is that your learned, academic, and scholastic standing that you're going to teach? He said, yes, it is. I said, well, would, would you mind if I ask you one or two questions? Since the NAACP and SCLC has finished that course in the ABL and the JBL and the Irish Catholic Society and the Italian American Society are still vibrant organizations. Man, can you tell me two things that the ABL or the JBL or the American Catholic Society took stance on last year? Just two things that they had done. She paused. I said, no, you can't. You don't know two things they've done, and you're so disconnected from who you are, you don't know two things that we've done. The problem we have is not that we've completed our job. The problem we have is a problem uh, that is simply too many of us have disconnected. from the train that has brought us safely thus far. Now I know there are some that have suggested to us that uh, marching is over and that the movement has done still moved from the streets to the sweets. <laughs> But the truth of the matter is, the streets were always wide enough to be inclusive. That's right, that's right. The streets were always narrow enough to be exclusive. The streets were never meant for everybody. The only people who were ever allowed in the streets were the marginalized, the homogenized, and the paralyzed. They moved us from the street because our strength was in the street. They could not handle us in the street. And so they moved us to the street. But we lost our purpose, our power, and all of our people. In a few days, we're going to go to Washington. When we get to Washington, we are going to marvel as on the title mission, they are going to recognize the first hero of peace. Every other statue, every other monument that is on the title mission recognizes some war hero. But when they unveil that marvelous likeness of our fallen prince, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he will be the first ambassador of peace. We're going to stand back and we're going to marvel at the monument. But the truth of the matter, my brothers and sisters, I cannot understand why we are so excited about Martin's monument and so forgetful about Martin's movement. It is not monuments that do us. It is movements that do us. What we need to do now is get up, stand up, stand up, speak up. Jesus, take me to 
will still fight on. We promise. Never to leave us. Never to leave us alone. Why don't you stand on your feet and shake somebody's head and go, never alone. Never alone.